here, you'd see, you'd see the opcode that they're executing for the entire cycle of the, uh, the amount of cycles that that instruction took. Does anybody have questions so far? Am I going too fast or, or not explaining clear enough or should I speed up? We got a lot more stuff. This is old stuff. Okay. So, uh, it's not a cool chip from, from Fujitsu. Anybody here with, use Fujitsu chips? No? So it looked like a mess. They did some weird stuff, but look again, microcode right here, or PLA, whatever, whichever it is. And here's the bus lines. But what threw me off when I looked at this the first time was the bus lines didn't, nothing came in from the bottom of the chip right here. And then I, the only place I saw the data bus come in was way out of, it's not in this image, it's way out of view on the left. The 8 bits came in. But then I looked at it a little closer and I only had one of these chips to, to look at. I, so I couldn't strip it down. But what I could do is image it high res now and then rebond it and, and power it up and, and work with it. And so I imaged it high res and then and studied it. And what I was able to study was that this was basically laid as rows, eight rows across the chip in, in the area of the core. And so the, you know, in these rows, you, each row was a bit weight, D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, and so forth. And what actually happened was the bus line came in, went down to the bottom layer of metal and came in entirely across the chip and popped out here and then popped out here and popped out here. So all, all eight bits popped out here and meanwhile they interconnected at various points, what I'll call columns for say um, data pointer register, program counter, um, you know, register one, register two, whatever, whatever the architecture is. Um, but, but the most important thing of the chip that makes this thing tick is they come up here, they trickle through and then they plugged into eight flip flops up here. And then they had, then they had a nice line here that followed through the inverter that basically was was always driven low. So hold it low, set, sit on the bus, eavesdrop the bus, and, and you walk the bus with one needle. So with two needles, you dump this chip, and you've dumped every other chip that I've spoke about so far today. Microtech is this Chinese smart card company. Microchip, Microtech used the same exact flash that TS, you know, from TSMC, except TSMC said, oh, now we have filler metal on the surface, so it's more secure. Something like this they're going to probably be peddling. And, but I've already studied the flash on the older Freescale parts that you can buy, the 908 series of Freescale. And so you can see here the ordering of the flash. The chances that the user that designed into this TSMC process modified the, uh, these lines is probably, is almost zero, per, zero possibly, uh, zero percent possibly. Um, so it, here's that, that die and here I've marked exactly what to do. So I've said, okay, um, it's 25 to 27 spaces over for, uh, you know, from M3. I don't know really what I mean there actually, but, you know, <laughs> um, I, I think I, I don't know. Anyway, so and then right in this box is where I want to dig and what's under there is data bus bit zero. And so what I, I made an assumption here because when I had stripped it down, um, these are, this is a stripped down chip but I didn't polish it. So if I had polished it with a lapping machine, I could get rid of all the oxide here and make this look smooth as can be. Um, just the, some notes on the chip. There's that filler again. It's everywhere. Um, here's some dark images of it. I'm just looking for uh, the bright image. So here, here's a delayer chip and we've got a huge flash here, 128 kilobytes. We've got two huge uh, static RAMs. We've got two small static RAMs. This should be the 256 internal bytes. And then we have a boot ROM. So there's a ROM right here. Well, guess what? I'll bet you money that they boot from this ROM and then they, then they, then they uh, check the flash for like FFs or something. And if they see FF, then they boot, they stay in the ROM and they let you download or upload to it. You know, read or write to the flash. Very poor, very poor um, instantiation of, of a security measure. This is supposed to be a smart card, remember. So here's the ATR coming out of the chip from what this went to. And so ATR is coming out of the chip and, all, and I'm just sitting there with a needle down on D0 and I'm taking the other end of the, I'm not even using a buffer. And I'm taking the, uh, the needle, the, um, uh, the, the end of a coax line and I'm shorting it on ground. And so it just literally like this as it's resetting. And lo and behold, all of a sudden on clock, on, on reset 3B, the ATR changed. Well, guess what? That was the bootloader ATR. And so I glitched it back into the bootloader using a simple, you know, my, 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 my hand with, with a, you know, with a probe in my hand. It just, it's, it's crazy. But this is a secure smart card from a Chinese manufacturer. So, sorry? 
It is ASCII. This is actually a Dreambox clone chip for the Dreambox uh, free to air receivers. So this was some Dreambox smart card chip that the Chinese produ you know, had put in for the clone of the real Dreambox uh, receiver. And so, um, so, so just actually, I did this in about five minutes after I was playing, you know, once I exposed D0 in five minutes or so, I, I, you know, just, I got it. And I couldn't believe it. I was laughing. Because um, I was in the middle of another job and this was just like, I was just playing around. Um, you could see here like those, the older smart card chip. I'm going to speed up guys because I've only got, I've got like eight minutes. Um, and so I'm going to actually skip a couple things. Um, before we spoke about Darkfield, here's the corner of that boot ROM and that 8051 from 1983. That's Darkfield. Here's Brightfield on the same microscope. So just flick a switch and it switches this, the mode. So Brightfield, you can't really read the ROM. You can't really see the bits. Switch to Darkfield, boom. Now you can see them clear as day. It's just, it's, things have a purpose sometimes. When you, I build up a lot of junk and I always find a use for it. So, because the optical microscope today is not, not, that, not that good. I use a fib today like crazy. And so like the 66 PE, uh, I'll polish them down using a lapping machine. So I'll strip off a layer. I get all that oxide residue left. The metal floated away. It's gone. And, and I, get, I make these images on, on the fib after I polished it. So I polish them down until the actual metal is exposed to the, to the air, to the atmosphere. Now if this was copper, which it would be if you're at 45 nanometers or below 130. 130 below, you're going to be copper. Uh, this would oxidize within time unless it's in, in like a vacuum chamber, uh, which it wouldn't be permanently. So here's like, here's the, the actual core of the 66 PE that I was after to study. Now what's interesting on the fib, if this had been an SM, these lines would all have been white. They would have been white. But the fib's giving me voltage contrast. So this is telling me that these lines have been disconnected and they came from the surface. They came from up above on the upper metal layer. And so I polished this thing so smooth that you can still see, these are the vias where they made a connection before. So does anybody do this kind of stuff like polishing chips? I know you do, Karsten, but does anybody else? No? This is a process that it's pretty fun, but you just, you take a bunch of chips, you strip them all to the same level, and then you practice. You could build your own polisher too if you really tried. You just, the liquid is really what you need to get, which is about $100 for a gallon of it. Um, here, if they had made microcode changes to the 66PE, I would have seen it in this table. This is one of the instruction tables. The 66PE, as I've discussed when I did the TPM attack, runs a microcode. And so um, it's kind of their doom. You know, now the bus scrambling I spoke about earlier, nobody's doing that anymore. They're doing it maybe outside the core, but in the actual central nervous system of the chip, the, the CPU is almost never scrambled, and I don't know why. Here's the metal two layer of that same area. So, so now in Photoshop, I can stack these images, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to find that fast. I'll find that last. So another cool thing in the fib, you get a chip like an ST with a mesh. I can drill down a hole. I, I can, so I, this is all tungsten residue right here, or platinum residue. Um, I have both metals in my fib. So I drilled eight holes and touched the bus line. The bus line is running exactly uh, north and south on this picture. So from the top to the bottom, it's running down the chip. So I found the isolated where the bus line was with a reference right here, but it's out of view kind of. But right in here, these, that's a hole that I dug to see where are the lines down on metal three. I use a chemical called xenon difluoride in the fib to do this without hurting the metal. Made, so drilled eight vias down, touched metal one, and then, then filled the via to the surface with platinum, and then made little donut rings in platinum as well. And so then I had to isolate them because these would have been shorted out. So then I used that same xenon difluoride gas, and I, and I very carefully milled, just milled, you know, just milled boxes around them. And, and it's black because it's an insulator again. The, the tungsten's been removed, and this is the oxide. Where here, the, this is like a spray can when I'm using the, the, uh, the, the tungsten uh, deposition. It's, it's, it, there's overspray always. Uh, so that was called a cleanup. Here's um, some, some, um, some random chip that didn't have good grounding. Atmel Mega 8, anybody use a Mega 8? Nobody? Okay. Uh, the poly, not a very good, I need to practice when I'm polishing the poly. Um, ST Thompson, 350 nanometer process. It's used for like Nagravision, people around the world, GSM SIM cards. Um, not secure, but people have to focus to break it. Um, this is again polished, not perfect, but good enough for what I was after. So you can see like an overall mosaic I was starting to make of the chip. So these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, five across. So this would have been five across by somebody down, just to give me an overall mosaic and the fib. It's kind of just, I just did it because I could, but I didn't actually stitch them yet. Um, just no time. And so, um, 
I was going to discuss this stuff, but I just, there's not enough time to really cover it. When you, the ST mesh, even today, I just did this last week with Karsten Knoll, make a nail polish mask, boom. Um, it's in the wired video, you, you can see it. The mesh is gone. The chip's alive if I repair the mesh, if I jump it. Here I'm focusing on the mesh, the actual top metal itself to show you. Um, and here I'm focusing on the actual lines down below. There's seven to six, mesh is out of the way, hit it with a laser and touch the bus and, and, and it's no problem. Um, get into newer chips, 180 nanometer chip, same technique, nail polish attack, boom. I just did it. Did it with Karsten the other day. The problem was that that, that the nail polish, like um, it flaked off or something from, from too many rinses and etches. These are very, these are very small timed etches, like 10 seconds, 15 seconds. You dip it in, you know, a drop, on, a drop of, um, a drop of hydrofluorics going down here, diluted for 15 seconds, rinse it, check it, do it again, rinse it, check it. And the hot plates, you know, this, it's slowly breaking down the nail polish al along with the HF2. But you can see here the lines below. And this chip will work if I jump the bus. There's no reason it wouldn't run still. With the Thompson, remember, I only have to bridge one line. So here's, an, here's a Thompson, brand new K7. This is the exact same chip Nogger 3 uses. That's why I don't understand why it's never been broken, except that the hackers are lazy maybe. I don't know. Um, or the Canadians are, are uh, I don't know, maybe the laws changed in Canada. So here you can see I dropped tungsten across here. And uh, this is a tungsten deposit. You can see the overspray. And it's so far out of the way I don't need to clean it up. And so this is connecting the mesh line from here to here. I went way over, way, this is overkill. I didn't have to do it like that. And, and it gets even better. I can really just go to the end of this mesh line and just jump it to VCC. Even today, the latest Thompson chips, the latest ST 180, 150 nanometer chips only have to be tied to VDD, whatever the, the, the input voltage is to the core. Um, they give you, the, some give you like a fake oscillation, but it's clocked by a digital circuit and that digital circuit samples that waveform when it's high. And um, here, after I did this bridge as a test, I, I ate through the mesh. These are eight random lines. They're not the data bus. I don't know what they are. I just was doing it to show you guys. And then if you want to know how small that really was, uh, it's here. So you can see, oh, I'm sorry, it's here. It's here. It looks like a speck of dirt. It's so small. And so here's the bridge. And here, this is optically looking at it at 1,000 power. And here's the hole I made. It's so tiny. And then here's the edge of the chip that says K7 something. That 7 means it's 100, well, no, it doesn't, I'm sorry. Um, if you reference this code back to the chip, it's, a, it's an STW. So this is actually 180 nanometer. STN is 150 or so. Um, does any, anybody have any, any questions? No? I do need to show you one thing, though, before you go. Um, okay, one question. Hit do you have any software that you're using to automate the analysis of the imagery? Uh, I, it's something I'm working on, but I don't. I actually do this all by hand, <laughs> which is crazy. But um, I'm working with Karsten up here in the front row, and uh, he, he's, he's got a nice set of tools out there that, that can help me to automate it. And there's, other, there's various other programs that can help automate it, too. Um, I didn't even, the, like SC23 is 90 nanometers. Here's the ROM of one. You can see the ROM bits there, clear as day. As day. But um, I, t I literally will typically do this by hand. But if I'm going to image a ROM like this, I, I, need, to, I need to do it automated. I, there's no way I can sit there. And I'm also going to assume that the ROM is encrypted. So I want to get an image of it, and then I want to study the, the, uh, how it drives the, uh, the addressing scheme, and then where, where the bus goes. Into the, as soon as it gets into the core, where is it going to go? Here's, an, here's another picture of that 90, 90, 90 nanometer part. Um, 90 nanometers is a pain in the butt, so I don't even want to know 40, what 45 is like. And this is, uh, a another, again, a mesh that they're trying to give an, you know, another impression of. Does anybody else have a, a question? Uh, can you come to the mic? I was late, so apologies if you already addressed this, but uh, what about the SLE 78? Is that something you're working on? I haven't seen any. If I saw some, I'd love to see some samples because I have a feeling it's not as secure as they're claiming. And things never are, even the 88. I can't really work on the 88 though because I, I had an NDA with them in, like four years ago. That's the only reason I don't talk about the 88. But um, the, 70, the 78 is going to be something like the 88, which is like a dual rail type and infrastructure. And, but what happens after the checksum? I mean, you know, like it's so funny, Infineon came with a comeback up to, about me and they were like, oh, the opcode is never in the clear. Well, that's BS. Anybody that designs CPUs knows that somewhere in the core, that instruction's in the clear. So what's going to stop, what, what's going to need to happen on an, on an SLE 78 